We are at the GZT News Center. There is an intense crisis broadcast on what is happening in Palestine. And here I am making the final assessment of the video you are about to watch. It follows Israel's ground offensive in a bombardment of information. Sometimes reform is conscious, while other times it's the result of misguided interpretations. Now if you want, let's make an analysis on the map with Abdullah Ahar, an expert on the subject. Let's make predictions. Let's see what clues Israel's ground attack gives for the coming days or weeks. By the way, we have a small request before the video starts. You can support us for new episodes by subscribing while watching the video. We will read your comments together with Abdullah Ahar after the broadcast. Now let's go to the top of the map, and what will Israel do in the unique residential neighborhood of Gaza? What will it face? Let's talk about that. We want to get straight to the point, because it is really an unknown equation for us as well. But of course, you are in a subject that you can explain more comfortably and over the field, over the map. One of the most curious issues about Israel's ground operation is this. Why did this ground operation start from Salahattan Street? We can start from there. Now, Salahattan Street spans all of Gaza, so it is the main axis. Let's mark it like this. Let's draw it like this. Roughly like this. This is the main road, and it goes all the way to the Rafa border crossing. There is also a road over there, a Reshit Street. At the same time, it's a parallel road. And it's road. the second longest street. This is already defined as the coastal road. Now, the effort to seize the main axis was specifically aimed at getting out of here. It's important for it to be brought out in a controlled manner because ultimately there are still around 300,000 people in Gaza, in North Gaza specifically. What is the goal? It seems to have a topographical purpose, but there is also a demographic purpose. I mean, what is the demographic goal to dehumanize this place? And by depopulating, they're preparing a suitable ground for their military operations, because in some way they are aware. It seems that the United States is exerting certain pressures. A military operation carried out among civilians would harm the geopolitical interests of the United States. They are aware of this. In fact, they have relevant experiences from the past. There are photographs indicating that around 400 civilians died in a legitimate opposition clash during their previous operations here. These situations are putting Israel in a difficult position. What is the goal of the other side? I've opened the floor for this. I opened this place. I wanted civilians to leave from here. I provided for it. I laid out the possibilities regarding this but they didn't leave. Then a diplomatic pretext is being taught. About what? Because at that time, those here were trying to construct sentences like Hamas's disciples, militants, underground organization, sympathizers, and somehow justify the humanitarian losses that would occur here. Hoja, in the northern Gaza section, which attracted our attention, we saw that Israel entered and besieged in the sense of an operation at first. What was the actual meaning of this, starting the operation from both here and the other side? Now, my understanding is this. First of all, you have marked this place like this. You know, it is correct in terms of making sense of the map. But this has not been realized as an action. It has not been a success, in my opinion. Why is that? Because for you to say that such an area is completely in Israel's hands means that Israel has somehow controlled and cleared all the neighborhoods, all the houses, all the workplaces, all the buildings it demolished. No, it has not cleared this place yet. Now Israel is saying that I have completely captured this place. The Hamas side is also saying something. Yes, they entered here, but they captured the roads and crossroads here. In other words, with the elements of the armored troops there, they are creating some resistance points, some upper areas. This place... What does that mean? The upper zone, as we know it, is actually an upper zone on the highway in a residential area. Now each residential area has its unique spirit, its unique nature. This is specific to Gaza. Comparisons can be made with other places. Yes, there might be overlapping aspects, but this is a snapshot specific to Gaza. Now, what's the goal? It's trying to forge an anvil here. My interpretation, it entered from the narrowest point, entered from here and tried to reach the coast. Now, there are scattered Israeli military points here. We see that it controls some areas on land, on the surface of the ground. It already tells us about the weights of their involvement, but it's not as, as dominant underground. Uh, it hasn't cleared out all the buildings. So this is still a very complex picture. Why do I say it's a complex picture? Because there's a statement from the Israeli side, there's a statement from the army's side. 
They said that so far, that is, uh, since October 7th, we have suffered more than 400 casualties. This is not a very accurate statement. Since when did they inflict more than 400 casualties? They started on Sunday last week, so it has been about 10 days. What they have put forward about the ground operation, what does that mean? It means they are inflicting roughly 40 casualties on us every day, based on the official Israeli statement. That's a big number. Now, depending on the scale of this figure, looking at the areas here that haven't been fully cleared, this matter becomes even more complex. But we can't do Hamas here. Why can't we do Hamas? Because, especially since the 7th of October, the horrendous impact of those bombardments, not just on the civilian population, but also on Hamas, is what? What is the effect on Hamas? What is the impact on the tunnels? What is the impact on the capabilities of Hamas? We don't know that. Actually, I was going to ask about this, Hoja. We talk a lot about the influence of Hamas after the operation on October 7th. We talk a lot about its tunnels, its military forces, its experience in the field. However, it seems that we have not seen its full reflection in the field at the point reflected here. What has Hamas done so far in terms of defense, in terms of defense rather than attacking Israel? What might we have encountered? So now, of course, there is some data shared by the parties from the field. First of all, I will say to the esteemed viewers and followers that it is not right to read the statements made by the parties. I mean, because both sides here, yes, there is a struggle on the field, but there is a great struggle, especially in perception. There is a great struggle in public destruction. There is a great struggle in propaganda, and there is a huge struggle in agitation. So what are we going to do here? We will try to understand and grasp the situation correctly. And through this, we will combine the statements made by the parties. We will try to confirm it from independent sources, and we will try to make sense of it with our own knowledge, our own judgment. Now, if you look at the statement about this place, if you look at Israel, it has completely taken over this place. If you look at Hamas, they only captured the road checkpoints here. Now they are making two very different sentences. I say that yes, a military presence has shown itself here, it has paid the price for this, but it will continue to pay the price because it could not make this place completely Hamas free. Why? Because thousands and thousands of people live here. Let's make a basic statement like this. 2.3 million people live in Gaza, right? Now this means roughly 400,000 houses. Roughly, let's say five people live in each one. There are also workplaces. Now roughly 200,000 of these 400,000 houses are in this area. Now there are at least 50,000 houses and workplaces here. Did the Israeli side look at these 50,000 workplaces and residences? No, it hasn't. So this might take years to accomplish. It hasn't come to that point yet. It's implementing something else. And because of what it has implemented, it's suffering losses. And these losses could deepen over time and may reflect on the Israeli army, the Israeli public, and the international community supporting Israel. Because this issue might not just end here. Because here, not only will the Israeli army suffer losses, trying to counter these losses, they might be causing much more damage to Hamas's side and to civilians. Because the civilians here, there was a woman in the hospital. A doctor said a sentence like this. Yes, she said, I went south. But she said she came back. She said, I want to die in my own house. If I am going to die, she said, I will die here. I mean, look, there are people who approach like this. And death has become so common that they take it for granted. There has been so much trauma that they are no longer afraid of death. She says she has accepted death and they don't get out of here. Now, this is a very important parameter. The continued presence of civilians here will affect both sides very much. It will affect both the Hamas side and the Israeli side. And on the other side, uh, there is a presumption. Uh, there is a matter of presumption. Let me make this sentence again. Now, there is no value for the Israeli side to kill thousands, tens of thousands of Palestinians, innocent people. We are aware of this. We already see that. But Israel has this problem. How many dual passports, dual citizens, especially those carrying American passports, will die under Israeli bombs? Now, this is one of the basic presumptions of the war. On the other hand, Hamas is practicing garrison warfare. It is trying to implement it. But on the other side, Israel has dilemmas against this garrison warfare. Now, what are those dilemmas? Now, we've taken control of this place like this. No, it's not like that. Do you know what will happen here during this operation? Firstly, Israel will start living in a sock it has knitted on its own. What's that? Didn't it destroy all the buildings? It caused damage. But all of these have turned into natural fortifications. If Hamas can utilize these natural fortifications, Israel will struggle a lot here, too. Now, we mentioned that each occupied area has its unique nature. 
it has a fundamental character. What is it? Command and control. Command and control. Coordination. They struggle a lot in occupied areas. Speed is a challenge. Three, you can't do reconnaissance and surveillance. Four, you can't use your power the way you want to. All of this has happened and is happening to Israel. Do you realize that? He is not just saying these things. But if we make the right readings, Israel's job here is not as easy as it is thought to be. Yes, it has a very big firepower. It is very powerful. We see that. It uses it in a deadly way. It uses it savagely. But around here, that may not be enough. But it depends on what? It depends on Hamas's capabilities. Now, these capabilities of Hamas are unpredictable right now. I said the basic thing. We cannot act arrogantly. There has been a deadly bombardment here for a month. 33 days of continuous shelling. What effect has this had on the tunnels? They used M117 tunnel bombs. In other words, they used what we call demolition bombs. They used MK84s. He used penetrating bombs. He used other MK series bombs like the MK54. When they actually deploy them, what kind of impact do these bombs have, especially in densely populated areas? Now, some of Hamas's tunnels have been discovered in earlier operations in Gaza by Israel. Some of them were destroyed, filled in, etc. It was seen here that these tunnels have an average depth of 120 feet. That is about 40 meters. In fact, let me put it this way. I read it in a foreign source. The deepest tunnel in the world was discovered in Gaza. Do you know how deep it is? 230 meters. Look at it. It's 230 meters deep. Why? This is from the experience that Hamas has taught us. Why? It has been subjected to airstrikes before. Hamas saw that its tunnels on the surface collapsed when they were hit. Then it said, I will build deeper. How much deeper? 120 feet on average. So it went down to 40 meters. Now, what is the purpose of going down to 40 meters? To avoid being affected by the penetrating bombs that Israel has. But now there is something like this. This time, Israel has started to use more effective bombs, more advanced penetrating bombs given by the US. Now, we don't know how effective these were. The Israeli side is not saying, the Hamas side is not saying. We will start to judge this better in time. But even if it is dominant on the surface, it does not mean that it is dominant underground. Let's talk about that. Special troops are setting up special security points, especially in this region. Some information coming from the field is that this area has started to expand. What should Israel do in terms of holding that area? I mean, it is actually a place that is very vulnerable to being surrounded due to its structure. In military terms, a military security point has been established here. How will it ensure the security around it? This is not an easy thing. Let me mention a figure. Uh, you know, in military terms, there's something like this. Now we know roughly how many Hamas fighters there are. There are 40,000 in total. So Hamas, Islamic Jihad and other small organizations. Now it is said that their number is 40,000. Now against 40,000, how can you or should you produce an area domination here with three times that number? So you need 120,000 soldiers for this place. Does Israel have these 120,000 soldiers? I think not. Why not? Now you cannot carry out the residential area operation with an army built with a normal conventional logic. What do you need? You need elements that know how to conduct a residential area. Does Israel have preparations for this? Yes, in a special kind of way. Let's put it this way. Israel has a branch army. There is a branch army called the Combat Engineering Branch Army. In other words, it was created to support such operations. On the other hand, it has a special unit called Yahalom, which was created to provide and develop weapon equipment and ammunition, including the training of the residential area, and to conduct simulations related to this. Within this special unit, there is another unit called Samur, which is somehow related only to tunnels. There is a dog unit called Okins. On the other hand, there are units within all security forces that will carry out operations on tunnels and residential areas. But with whom will they do this in particular? Their own special forces. So with Unit 262. So what was its name? Seriat Matkal. Seriat Matkal and Yamam will handle it. That's also a counter-terrorism unit. Are their numbers sufficient? No, they're not sufficient. Now, here comes another equation. What does it do? It enters with its armored units because the numbers are not sufficient. Okay, you're entering with armored units, but something else happens. You're offering a variety of targets that Hamas can hit. Look at what Hamas is doing. With the Yasin 105 tandem-backed anti-tank missiles in hand, it's infiltrating. It's infiltrating through our grip. Coming out of the tunnel or out of the debris, it shoots and flees. 
What is the root of these tanks, Hoja? So it's related to Israel's advance on land. Now, what did we see from here in the first place? Actually, first of all, we saw in the area where the Rafa border crossing is. Then we saw it in Khan Sheikhun. Actually, it tried there first. Unconfirmed information from the field is that they dropped about 10 tanks there in the beginning. So we don't know because you know the sides. Now, later on. Does Israel also indicate that there is a plan B? Uh, what did they do first? First, they tested their own capabilities. They went in and out of a field. What did they do while they were going in and out? They tried to destroy the positions they saw as possible, the positions they could capture with tank fire. They tested Hamas's capabilities. Both sides weighed each other. In the meantime, they prepared a plan. So now, at the very beginning, they stood up with great anger, great hatred. But anger and hatred can have some expensive consequences in such an operation because of its aces. And then they narrowed the target, they prepared a plan and said we will divide the north and the south. What did they do to divide? They are trying to create an anvil here. This anvil, I'm still saying it, I'm not saying they created it, they are trying to do that. So the fact that we have marked this place in blue does not mean that they have completely taken over this place. There are actually only these points here. There are points. Yes, there are. It created a number of points like this. We don't know the occurrence or number. These are not disclosed. Now they have a number of things here. There are points of resistance. Now here's the thing, there is a side to it. Now you create a number of points here, but if you fail to connect these points, if you continue to create some problems with their supply and logistics, Hamas, for example, broke your logistics lines. All of these here are knock, knock, knock. Once, for example, they have one wounded person and they cannot evacuate this wounded person, they will be a slave in the field. No, first of all, such operations are difficult. Difficult in what sense? You are here on your own, you have wounded, you have casualties, you have dead, then you can't take them with you. It has extremely negative effects on the morale of the soldier here, on his determination and will to fight, on his ability to hold on there. For one thing, a bullet is fired from a gun. It doesn't hurt, it's over. What will he do if he has no logistics? These are all more watery images, nothing yet. This is how it is now. The entries they made from here are actually related to this. I mean, because this is a core and these are hammering fields. These are actually the main supporting parts. Now, this will create a buffer zone here. That seems to be the intention. It's going to create a zone of influence. It will try to hit, hit and hit from here. In other words, it will try to push toward them. Now we'll see this. It's being attempted. How much is this? It's about a seven kilometer advance here. So it will move forward about seven kilometers along Reshit Avenue. Can we attribute the progress here to the density of the terrain? I mean, it's now look easier. over there. Uh, let me show you. Look, these are fields. These are cultivated areas, right? These are not residential areas. Residential areas are visible here. It's obvious. Now it is relatively easy for armored troops to advance here. Hamas's resistance against this advance may cost Hamas dearly. And on the other hand, they can do something to Hamas. In other words, Hamas cannot have the military effect it wants here. It cannot demonstrate psychological superiority. What are they doing? They go in here, they are capturing these places here and so on. They have such moves. But as we said, these are not residential areas. But if we come to dense areas like Jabalia, for example... Now we'll see. Uh, now look, look, Dokan, I'm telling you this. Look, do you know why it's not Hamas? Now a doctrine and a power are clashing here. Now Israel is a state. This state has unlimited resources. Unlimited resources, yes, limited actually. But the United States gives it unlimited efficiency. I mean, it sends it all the time. So far, hundreds of C-17 Globemasters have landed. C-130 Hercules has landed, C-5 Galaxy has landed. Israel has gone and brought them with its own airplanes. Weapons, equipment, ammunition are constantly coming. Special quality materials are coming. The Israeli side has no problem with this. This is a conventional power, and we are not recognized as a qualified superiority in the Middle East geography. Yes, the United States sold weapons to Israel, but the weapons it sold had a special feature. They were superior to the hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons it sold to the Arabs. And we call this qualified superiority in terminology. Now, to whom that is? To Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Jordan, Egypt. He sold a lot of weapons. It made hundreds of billions of dollars, but the weapons it sold, the doctrine it gave, was a notch below what it owed Israel in health. What did this lead to? It gave Israel an upper hand in the Arab world. It gave rise to an influence, a deterrence, a prestige. This power exists, but something else happened here. Actually, we need to touch on that. Do you know what happened? Yes, it's so powerful, but it has a weak spot. Now, do you know what happened here? The United States got very scared in Israel. Why were they scared? I won't say the forward base collapsed, but the collapse of the forward base created a huge risk. It was damaged. No, 
it was more than damaged. It suffered severe wounds. They were very scared. So the root of Israel's generating such a major attack lies in this fear because it thought it faced an existential threat, experienced it, and began producing a terrifying attack along with its fear. This is very important. So now Netanyahu is coming out, constructing some theological statements. These are very bold statements. But on the other hand, what happened is obvious. Now, why did the United States send that lieutenant general? Actually, those lieutenants were basically sent for this. They said, understand the state of our outpost, see it, attend its meetings, look at the state of mind of its soldiers, the state of mind of its decision makers, and watch them go on a nuclear spree. They basically came with this intention. Otherwise, the Fallujah fox has arrived. No, the issue is that the Fallujah fox is exactly like a cunning mask, a cover. Now, they had a big problem here with the outpost. What did they do? 120 ships arrived from all over the world. Two of them are aircraft carriers, task forces. There's a buzzard carrying 4,000 Marines. In fact, we see that the reference to the two-stage effect has not fully intervened so far, physically. Now, there are some justifications they have shared with the public about sending aircraft carrier task groups. These are good statements, and they are true. So what are they saying? We sent it to support Israel. Here is the first aircraft carrier Ford. Where did the aircraft carrier task group settle? Do we have another map? Do we have a big map? We have another big map. Let's go this way. Do we have a map of the region? Let's look at this map of Lebanon. Now look, where did the carrier task group land? Right there. With Lebanon, isn't it the border between Israel? This is the point of contact. This is southern Lebanon. The aircraft carrier task group settled right on this line. So they said that with these ships, they said, if Hezbollah moves here, look, we are here. They said, we will ride directly on the hill. It generated significant deterrence. But was it just about generating deterrence? No, it led to a complete breakdown. So what was disrupted along with this Gaza attack? The Arab-Israeli agreements, the Abraham Accords were disrupted. There was a special effort. Now, in Iran and Saudi Arabia, China had made inroads. They were in talks, you know. The United States also had a special project against this, offering some security guarantees against whom? Against Iran including nuclear guarantees, even involving placing them under a nuclear shield, offering security guarantees to bring Saudi Arabia and Israel together. There's even a process like Egypt's recognition of Israel with Saudi Arabia. This also went into disarray or disruption. On the other side, there was a similar process carried out by the European Union. At the United Nations, what was that? That was the project of rapprochement between the Arabs and Israel, especially Israel and Palestine. So it was not only the United States, but also the European Union. Another side was the IMEC corridor. There may be some people who are not on the IMEC corridor. Biden announced it with great fanfare at the G20 summit. Here is India, the Persian Gulf, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Israel's Ashkelon port right here. Interestingly, the Ashkelon port. How did they hit it? How did they open it? Turkey had a process with the United States through the Israel lobby. And with Israel, there was the issue of the Eastern Mediterranean. There was also the issue of energy focused politics. These were also disrupted. Now, who is the big winner here? Iran. Isn't it? Because Iran was under a lot of pressure against the IMEC, against the Arab-Israeli rapprochement, against the rapprochement between Turkey and Israel, against the rapprochement between Turkey and the United States and all these things. Right? I mean, where was it under pressure from? First of all, it is destabilized within itself. There are some social demonstrations. On the other side, they have a big problem with the Taliban. It, it looks like a water issue, but there are deeper issues. On the other side, the Karabakh issue, it faced some risks of losing its initiatives, its geopolitical value. Now, in the face of these moves, such an image emerged. What will they do now? We started with aircraft carrier task groups. The main task of aircraft carrier task groups is to use it as an instrument of diplomacy. In other words, there is an effort to build all these broken things. But is this it? No, it's not. Look, um, no, now the most accurate reading is the one based on the mass. Now, when we see the mass, what capabilities does the mass have directly here and now? We look at that. I mean, aircraft carrier task groups came here. Did they only come here? No. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. Do we have another big map here? No. Anyway, let's explain it verbally. Where are aircraft carrier task groups located now? Now it is settling in an eastern Mediterranean. Plus beyond the eastern Mediterranean to the central Mediterranean in areas that concern us, where Greece, the island of Crete, the base is there and so on. Then it settles in the Red Sea. Then it settles in the Persian Gulf. It settles in the Gulf of Oman. Now when this happens like this, now wait a minute, 
we will then make an interpretative reading. What's that reading? Now, 120 pieces of aircraft carrier group arrived. The Americans, the French, the British are in the lead. So the British aircraft carrier and the French aircraft carrier also arrived. Now, they have spread to the Eastern Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf. They are taking positions. Now the Ohio class, Florida nuclear powered and nuclear capable submarine has arrived. It too is going to the Persian Gulf, it seems. Why the Persian Gulf? Here's what I think. Now from the very beginning, from day one, I tried to emphasize something, Gaza issue. Yes, it is the Gaza issue until the end, but there is a big conspiracy here. There is a big scam. Let's not go into it. Now, but something has happened. Now we will ask a question like this. Can Hamas and Israel live together from now on? These are the questions here. But what is the big question? From now on, what kind of balance will Israel, the United States and Iran create in the Middle East? This is the battle being fought right now. What effect will these ships, this buildup have? Look, that is the most important question. Now, yes, we have seen there is deterrence, there is a show of force, there is repair, but then there is an impact picture, there is an impact capability. They came to provide a strategic advantage. Now, where will it use this strategic superiority? Now, it looks like Iran. We are already saying this. Now, what was Israel saying? Before October 7th, it was telling the United States that we are extremely uncomfortable with Iran's nuclear capability and capacity and that we will prevent it whether you are on my side or not. There are many examples of this in the past. So what did they do? They carried out many asymmetric operations even inside Iran, many assassinations and sabotage of scientists who were developing nuclear capability and military officials of the Revolutionary Guards. They carried out such operations. These were done. There are even these. Let me put it this way. Let me say that there are rumors that there are even operations over Golan Heights, over the airspace controlled by the United States, over Iraq to Israel to Iran, where Israeli planes go. Now, what happened here? For the first time, Israel has a great opportunity to support the United States thesis for Israel to contain its nuclear capability and capacity. Now these, these ships, is that why these ships came? To control the Strait of Hormuz, to control the Persian Gulf? This, this is a bargain. Is there a secret bargain between Israel and the United States, France, Britain, Germany? There is an accumulation that makes us think about this bargain. This is important. Now this is the part about Iran. What about Syria? Can it have an impact in Syria? This is a matter of concern for us as well. Iran is also of great interest to us, but in Syria there were unclear borders, weren't there? Here in Al Tamf there is the FSA, the American FSA. There is the YPG PKK terrorist organization here and there. Do you have a vision about this or will it undertake a mission? This is also an extremely important yes, question. That's a no, big question. we are just asking, aren't we? Just asking because there is a huge crisis of confidence that has marked all our relations with the United States over the YPG PKK. And somehow, and I shouldn't even say this, but it may be misunderstood. Now within Israel's theological ambitions, there are meanings that Israel is cooperating with terrorist organizations and non-state actors with some things related to this place, this geography. This is also important because the man says, I am not saying this, you may not believe me if I say it, but Netanyahu said it. Netanyahu says that my goal is theopolitical, theological. It says from here, all things. 2.3 million people will come out. They will come out in 24 hours. I will tear this place down and rebuild it. He probably won't build this place for his newspapers. Who will he build it for? That's the most important question. The man has such a mindset in his mind. This is nonsense. He talks irrationally, but there is such a belief. He believes this. Is this belief only in him? No, this belief exists in this one too. In fact, the signs on the field also show this. No, that's not the problem. This is a small country, not a country with depth. Yes, it has nuclear capability, but how much has faded, it has been revealed. This is the real plan. That is the problem because he's an evangelist, because he's a millenarian, because he's an Armageddonist. There's a mindset like this. And I think that's what needs to be questioned here. Who will question it? Not you and me. Those who believe in these ideas will question them. They'll either say, uh oh, or they'll continue to be Megiddo enthusiasts, great compassion advocates. Um, then after that, well, the evangelists, those who are forcing God into the apocalypse, the Armageddonists, they have prepared a great catastrophe for humanity. And this is because of our distorted, falsified beliefs, because of the books written by the clergy. Who will question this? The Jews and Christians who have a conscience, who have reason, 
that is, who produce rationality, will question it. And here we will actually make another statement. We can show those people the way. When I say we, I mean Turkey. This geography within the Islamic geography is perhaps the only country that can do this. Why? Because the answer to this question is embedded in the chemistry of Turkey's statehood. Because our state was founded on the experience gained from a world war. Our state was established based on the experience of the collapse of an empire. Our state was established by acknowledging the betrayals within. And it was built upon a Muslim identity. So, yes, I need to say this here because this is a very important premise. There's no secularism in the world. Do you know that secularism exists only in Turkey? Why am I saying this now? Well, with your permission, I'll express a criticism. I think neither those who claim to know what secularism is nor the conservatives truly understand Turkish secularism. Do you know what Turkish secularism is? Turkish uh, secularism is for religion and the religious. It was to prevent the abuse of the state and power by the abuser of religion, that is the clergy planted within Islam. Because I said, look, you started from the betrayals in the First World War. You started from the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. This statement is based on the consciousness produced by the First World War. Yes, we took it from the West, but where did the West get it from? From the wars of the century, the wars of the 30 years. What did they say? They said, we imprison the clergy and the church. We imprison them and set the mind free. They generated great power from here. But today we saw something. We saw that the West is not secular. The secularism of the West is so-called. So here, with Islamic health, Islamic scientific approach, Islamic reason, Islamic humanity, and Islamic rationality, can we show a correct path, a conceptual exit, to societies and the Islamic world that have been enslaved to all these natures and to the Islamic world that has been shattered? If we can do this, we will teach a great service to all humanity. We will teach a great service to the future. But there is a necessary condition for this. We need to get rid of our own theological mistakes. Look at this too, I must tell you. I have always said that there is a great lesson in Feta. What kind of lesson? There is a lesson in seeing where we made a mistake. There is a great lesson in Daesh there is an opportunity to see where we made a mistake. There is a great opportunity to see where we made a mistake in the Crusader Sabis, in other words, in sectarian sedition. But if we can see, if we can produce a revelatory reason, if we can produce a revelatory reason, a Quranic reason, if we can produce the reason that Allah wants from us, if we can produce conscience, if we can produce common sense, if we can produce knowledge, if we can produce reasoning, if we can produce solutions, there is a tremendous opportunity here to guide all humanity. God willing, we will do it. I mean, look, this is because I think like this, the West is broken. The East is broken. The North is down. The East, which is expressed and claimed to have come from, is also collapsed. Why is that? Because they don't use power for good. Now, all humanity needs a will, a conceptual approach that can use power for good. Turkey can do this. Look, my hope is already here. As I always say, there is God, there is no sorrow, there is God, there is no despair. Can we realize this? I believe so. But we need to learn the lessons. Look, Feto is dirt that emerged from within us. In other words, it is a scalpel shot from the inside of our body. Feto is a pus flowing from our body. Now we have seen this pus. We say this is pus, right? If we can do this, and if we can use revelation as a mind, revelation as a conscience, revelation as a wholeness, a holistic approach, if we can do these things, we can solve all our problems. We can address them, this one, that one, the one above, the one below, the one on the other side, the one here. This is really a very important thing that will earn you your rights. I mean, your efforts are also very valuable. Anyway, we've come this far, and now they get angry with me. They say, are you a theologian? No, I'm not a theologian. I've spent my whole life doing this kind of work. But as you say, Hoja, the events actually bring us there a little bit. So where did this we start? This is the problem of your work. This is the theological problem. I say... We started with airstrikes and ground operations. We came to the sea. We talked about the American build-up from the sea and we came here. Why did America bring the Patriots? Why bring the Patriots? The Patriots are the highest level, the highest level air defense system in the world created to protect the American state, its own land against nuclear attacks. In other words, it blocks in space. It blocks 150 kilometers of communication. That is, from above, from space. I mean, why? It is waiting for ballistic missiles coming from space. Now he's not bringing for a Hamas missile. Not for Hamas's missile. No, Hodja, it's not for Hamas's missiles. The man is saying something here. I mean, this weapon, equipment, ammunition he brings here says something to thinking people. It gives a message. So the issue is not just here. The issue is here. The issue is the whole world. 
Here lies the essence of street or urban warfare. We're within an equation with many unknowns, as described by Abdullah Aar's analogy of the cloak and the hammer. Will it be the number of supporters, their tactics, or the resources they have that will solve this equation? Only time will tell. Let's remind again, we will read and consider the comments you leave under the video with Abdullah Ayar. Looking forward to it. We are at the GZT News Center. There is an intense crisis broadcast about what is happening in Palestine, and here I am making the final assessment of the video you are about to watch.